Chapter One of Boy the Wandering Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Boy the Wandering Dog by Marshall Saunders. Book One My Life in the City. Chapter One I Seek and find a friend a few months ago i came in the course of my wanderings to the city of new york my my how the big city has grown since i was here a few years ago i entered it by way of a ferry boat from jersey city then i scampered up past city hall the hotel de gink and the tombs to the bowery of course the first thing was to make a friend i chose a solemn looking bulldog sitting round the corner from a saloon whose huge bulging window looked like a big eye staring down the street the dog who was brindle in colour and had a tremendous head sat tight up against the wall and was keeping a wary eye out for something i know not what good afternoon i said politely and not going too close to him how do you do he said morosely then he looked up at the elevated that's the worst of a big city no dog that's worth knowing cares a rap about you unless you force yourself on his attention oh come off the l i said brusquely you see i recognized at once that he was a bluff matter-of-fact dog who would not appreciate frills he did come off and gave me a glance you're no fairy he said hoarsely no and i'm no crazy cur either i replied and if i were you new york dogs would fall all over each other to entertain me you've got to be either a beauty a crank or a millionaire to get on in this city how did you like virginia he asked with a twist of his under jaw i'm a pretty self-possessed dog but i could not help starting a bit how did you know i have been in virginia i asked sharply he gave a snicker I know you're from the south for you're shivering on this mild day and Virginia is the nearest state south That has the exact shade of that lovely red mud sticking to your hind leg I'm not a southern dog I said hastily You needn't go out of your way to get hot telling me that he retorted you haven't the slick repose of manner of the southern dog well, I'm glad I've struck a four-legged Sherlock Holmes. I remarked good-naturedly. You're just the fellow to tell me where to go to get a square meal. Why don't you trot up town for your first feed? He asked with a relaxing of his sour expression, for he liked being compared to the famous detective. I smiled. There was no need to say anything, yet I said it. Uptown's fine after you have an introduction downtown doesn't ask so many questions <laughs> he laughed gruffly i like you come right in i'll share bones and titbits with you for a night follow me and he shuffled round the corner toward the family entrance of the saloon there he pushed his flat skull against a door in the wall and entered a yard about as big as a pocket handkerchief not many yards in the bowery now he said hoarsely happened to be a fire next door that burnt a building to the ground and fencing in the vacant lot gives us a place to stretch our legs good gracious i said the city is getting darker and darker yes he replied gloomily what with burrowing for the subways and skyrocketing for the elevateds and tunneling for the tubes the city is getting as black as yes yes i said hastily I know it's a habitation not mentioned in polite dog circles What's the matter with you? He asked in his choked voice if you're too good for your company get out. I'm not I said hurriedly I like you You're a regular sport. I Used to be he said settling down on the straw with a groan, but my joints the rheumatiz has got me I'm not like I used to be come on now reel off your life yarn. I've got an hour to spare What's your name and where were you born and where are you going? With your powers of observation you ought to be able to answer all those questions for yourself. I said demurely He looked me all over with his fine dark eyes You haven't got a name he said with a snort or rather you have many names You're a traveling dog 
You were born anywhere, and you don't know where you're going. I burst into such a delighted yell of laughter that he told me to shut up, or someone might hear us. "'What's the matter with you?' I asked wonderingly. "'And what's the matter with all the dogs here? I never saw such a cowed-looking set.' "'We're listening for the cops,' he said angrily. "'We've got a new health commissioner, and he's a—' "'Yes, yes,' I interjected hurriedly. "'A dear fellow. He doesn't understand dogs, probably.' "'Understand them? He's a fool. He says it's the citizens first if every dog has to go. He's muzzled every one of us, even when led on a leash. He wants to make little old New York a dogless city.' "'I suppose it's the old rabies scare,' I said. "'Sure, that's it. A poor dog loses his master. He runs wild and howls. A crowd chases him, and he foams at the mouth. Then they kill him. Rabies! Rats!' "'Come, come,' I said. "'We're dogs, of course, but let us look at the human point of view. "'There is such a disease.' "'Of course there is, but it's as rare as a summer's day in winter. "'You've got as much chance of being struck by lightning as of being bit by a mad dog.' "'Yet there are people killed by lightning,' I said. "'He was grumbling on to himself. "'The Lord made dogs. Man can't improve em. He gave us our mouths free to chew grass and pick a little earth for stomach troubles. You muzzle a dog and he gets sick and makes his master sick. The full commissioner hurts the humans more than he helps them. But he's trying to wipe out the disease, I said. There isn't much of it, and if the dogs are muzzled for a few years, it will be stamped out. Yes, and we'll have a dozen other worse diseases by that time. A muzzled dog is a menace to his master, I tell you. Let em supervise our health in some way. Let the government do as much for us as they do for pigs. Then we wouldn't hear of rabies. The commissioner's a fool. New York's rotten, anyway. I didn't dare to disagree with him, for he probably would have nabbed me. Well, I said humbly, I suppose we must let them come first. Who come first, he growled. Human beings. We're second. That's all right, he assented. Now, for the sake of human beings, I went on, who are as closely packed together as they are in New York, there shouldn't be many animals in with them. Sure, he said, I'm with you there. High license to keep a dog down. They're not happy themselves if they're cramped. But high license is against the poor man, I said. He could not afford to keep a dog for his children. Let him go without, said the bulldog. No, sir, not in these days of equality. How about having public playgrounds in crowded districts, with bird and animal pets, and a house with a caretaker to supervise the play of the children? They have such playgrounds now, he said, but they haven't any dogs and cats and birds. All right, he said, let em have em if you can get the dough. And furthermore, I continued, let the city give the superintendence of animals and birds to a person who understands them. The old dog was pleased now. That's right, he said. I'm with you there. Don't boss a job you don't understand. From what you say, I went on, it sounds as if your commissioner was very hygienic, but he has got the bull by the tail instead of by the horns. The old dog roared with delight. This was something along his own line, and seeing him so good-natured, I was emboldened to say, You spoke in quite a religious way just now, yet you keep a saloon. He turned on me quite fiercely. Do you suppose there's no religion in a saloon? I tell you there's more good nature and help your neighborliness down here in the Bowery than there is up on Fifth Avenue. What told you to come down here for a free feed, eh? You, a classy dog. But is that religion? I asked hesitatingly, for I didn't want to ruffle the old fellow and lose my dinner. It's the new theology, he said more agreeably. We don't go to church and sing hymns and make roly-poly eyes, but we buck each other up. Why, my minister sells the best of the little Hellgate distillery stuff. Yet if a fellow has too many drinks in him, he doesn't get another one from us. Well, I said easily, I try to be an up-to-date dog, and the latest theory is that drink takes strength away. First thing I noticed arriving here was the procession of saloons. First thing I noticed in the South was their absence. It had a kind of too-good-to-be-true look. I see Russia gets on better without the sale of vodka, 
said my new friend agreeably i guess we'd do just as well on the water wagon but you don't want to be too quick in hopping on it i often think that some of these fellows who come in here so dry and grabbing for their drinks would be just as well off if they had a lot of good old hot coffee the kind mother used to make but you'd have to go slow with them about putting the coffee pot in the place of the bottle i never can understand i said why men don't like grape juice and ginger ale and beer and all kinds of nice cool sloppy drinks better than the fiery stuff but that's been tried and they hate it a cunning gleam came in the old dog's eyes temperance folk don't understand they make their health places too clean and shiny and a man in overalls don't want to get in the eye of the public to take his drink and swap yarns with another pair of overalls i'll tell you what my mister's doing if you won't let on to the dogs round here they're a tonguey bunch certainly not i replied the old dog thrust his head out of his kennel to see if anyone was listening and then he went on it's this way mister goes uptown or downtown to some saloon say jones's says he how much do you clean up per annum jones jones says a thousand dollars mister asks how much will you sell for jones tells him mister either buys him out or goes in as a partner same old business goes on same old stand same old boss coffee runs in liquor runs out and before jones's pack know where they are naughty drinks are out and pious ones are in and mister makes more dough good thought i exclaimed i suppose if he'd shut up the old place and put up a temperance sign at first the men would have rung like deer sure said the old dog drive folks and they run from you coax them and they feed out of your hand is your master going to make this saloon into a good one i asked curiously maybe in time this gives him his title as saloon keeper your master must be a queer man i said i'd like to see him you never saw his match chuckled the old dog he could make money out of the cobblestones is he rich i inquired i should smile well i said i'm glad to hear he's a semi-philanthropist say just spell that word will you said my friend with mock politeness i spelt it for him then he said were you ever a preacher's dog yes i said and he was a fine fellow were you ever a saloon keeper's dog he went on with a twinkle in his eyes yes i said with a laugh for i rejoiced to see how keen he was before i left the south i had to associate with colored dogs for a time and while they were kindness itself they were not quick-witted like the white dogs i guess you were an actor's dog too weren't you continued old gringo for i had seen his name over his kennel yes sir i was and a grocer's dog and a milkman's dog and a doctor's dog and a postman's dog and a thousand ladies dogs and in short you're a very yes yes i said hastily i've boxed the compass as far as owners go he burst into a hoarse laugh i guess the human race ain't got any string on you well i said modestly i know considerable about men and women and children he said no i returned it isn't so easy to follow them they're so clever so very much more unexpectedly clever than the grown-ups it's a dull fashion now to kowtow to young ones he said crossly i don't like em myself except a few i suppressed a yawn i was powerfully hungry and so far not a word had been said about dinner suddenly my new friend trembled down on your knees he whispered waller in the straw keep cool then he filled up the kennel door with the stout muscular breadth of his body End of chapter one